You know, usually us Floridians in January stay south, and I know a lot of Midwesterners come come south, and I happen to be going around doing this, you know, it's colder, but I started bragging a little bit because I was like, you know, 35 degrees, honestly, I can deal with that, no big deal, I can do, and now it's got a little colder today, and then I looked at the weather forecast for caucus night, I'm going to have to go shopping to get some extra layers. I don't have that stuff. So we'll see. I hope we were able to do it. I want to thank Chip and Tom Massey for being here. Thanks for their support. I also want to thank uh, Governor Kim Reynolds for her support. The great, great governor. And, you know, you guys are lucky in Iowa because um, I have people every corner of the country comes to Florida at one point or another, and they talk to me about what's going on in their states. And I hear horror stories from California. I hear horror stories from Illinois. I hear horror stories from New York. The Iowans that come to Florida are very happy with how Iowa's governed. you got good members of the legislature, you got a great governor, and you're producing great results. So that's what we need for this whole country, what you guys have done in Iowa and what we've done in Florida. Now, Tom Massey has got this. They mention it. He, he wears on his jacket a national debt clock. So just like they have, I think, in Times Square where, the, where it's counting up, uh, he takes it around, shows it. These guys have to look at that when they're voting to increase our debt and continuing on the madness. And so he got me one. I think we were in New Hampshire a couple weeks ago. He got me one, and I was like, that's neat. But I said, you know, is there a way you could do a, a debt clock for the state of Florida? Because instead of counting upwards in Florida, you'd be counting the debt going down in Florida because we're paying off our debt. Imagine that. You're actually getting the job done. And then I think with these other states, New York, for example, is the closest state to Florida in terms of uh, population. But we have millions of more people now than New York State does. And yet our budget is half the size of New York's budget. We have the lowest percentage of uh, state workers per capita in the entire country. And yet, yeah, small government. And yet, when people move from New York to Florida, what do they tell me? They go, oh, my gosh. Your infrastructure is so much better. Your roads are nicer. Your services are more efficient. And your schools are better. So how are we able to do this at half the footprint and half the cost? Because it shows you so much of government is just bloat. We can reduce this federal government dramatically and not miss a beat for the things that actually need to be done for this country. And that's what we need to do. So we've got a job to do ahead of us, and, and Iowa gets to start on, on January 15th. Uh, I don't think that media determines who the Republican is. Well, actually, in some respects, you know, you can look at who does the media most not want to be the nominee, me. For Republican voters, that should be the best endorsement I could ever receive. I mean, that's just the way it is. So, but they don't get to decide, pundits don't decide, Iowans get to decide, and Iowans get to go out and make their voice heard. And this is going to be very consequential. For those of you who have committed to caucus for us, thank you. Make sure you bring friends, family, co-workers. Bring people out. Because this is going to be, in terms of bang for your buck and a vote, this will be one of the most powerful votes you'll ever get to cast. I mean, there's not that many people actually show up in the grand scheme of things, and yet this is going to have an outside influence on the direction of our country. Uh, because we need a candidate you know, who obviously can, can appeal to Republicans and win a Republican nomination, then, of course, win the general election in November like we did in Florida in a big way. But most important than that, we need a president who's going to deliver on all these things for us. We need to get the results, and we got to do it now. That's just – we got to do that. So, so we hope that – and, and if you are willing to commit to us after this, please sign up and do it. Uh, I, we've been able to see, you know, as the calendar shifted, we're now in an election year, you know, we're seeing a lot of people come to these events, which is great. Uh, so we've got a lot of real estate that we can that we can get on our side. And we have no other choice. I refuse to be amongst the only generation of Americans in history to leave to our kids and grandkids an America less prosperous and less free than the one we inherited. I am not going to just sit idly by and watch the managed decline of the United States. Uh, I don't think that this trajectory that we're on is inevitable. I think it's a choice. We have it within our power 
to reverse this decline. We have it within our power to give this country a new birth of freedom. And we have it within our power to usher in a revival of the American spirit. And we should accept nothing less uh, from the nominee of the Republican Party and the next president of the United States. I'm the only one running who can say that I've delivered on 100% of my promises. In Florida, when I promised I would do something, uh, I didn't just, it just wasn't idle talk. Uh, I actually said, okay, I've said this stuff. I got to go make it happen. And we do. You know, this stuff on campaign, you know, what is it? Just it's a slogan you say you're going to build the wall or drain the swamp? Or are you actually going to build the wall and drain the swamp? I mean, that's what we need somebody that's going to be able to follow through. And our record on that is second to none. The other thing, though, is we have uh, a situation in this country where the political left uh, is causing huge amounts of damage across all these different aspects of our society, the economy, the border, K-12 education, the bureaucracy, higher ed, all this stuff. I'm the only one running for president that has beaten these people time and time again in the state of Florida. We beat the teachers union on universal school choice and making sure schools were open during COVID, and now most recently with uh, protecting teachers against forced union dues. Uh, and now you have a lot of them that aren't, aren't joining, and places like Miami-Dade, uh, third largest uh, school union in America, is on the brink of decertification. So we're getting results with what we're doing. We beat Dr. Fauci on COVID. We beat him on the mandate. We beat him on the lockdowns. We beat him on the masks. All this stuff. We beat him on schools. And Florida is doing great as a result of that. We beat George Soros on crime. Two prosecutors that we had would not enforce the law faithfully, just like you see prosecutors not doing that in Philadelphia, Chicago, Los Angeles. I removed both of them from their posts. They are no longer in office. We also... We also have backed the men and women of law enforcement and stood by them. Uh, and as a result, Florida's crime rate is at a 50-year low. It's not true in a lot of other places. We beat the Democrats on election integrity. We have banned ballot harvesting in the state of Florida. We have banned Zuckerbucks in the state of Florida. We have universal voter ID. And we actually count the votes on election night and report the results the same day of the election. Imagine that. We also beat the left by banning China from purchasing land in the state of Florida. No farmland, no land near military, critical infrastructure, none of that. Uh, why would we want a hostile country to be able to come in and gobble up this key, these key pieces of real estate? And we need to do that all across uh, the United States of America. So. We have fought these fights, and we have won these fights, and it's going to take nothing less than that to be able to turn this country around. You know, I'm also the only person running for president uh, that has served in our nation's military and worn the uniform. And <laughs> for any veterans here, thank you for wearing the uniform, and thank you for serving our country. But I think it's important because it's been a while since we've had a veteran, I think since 1988, who served in a foreign war, get elected president. Um, it will help me, one, to put veterans' issues on the front burner, because there's a lot we need to be doing for our veterans that we've not done a good job on, and we'll do that. Second, uh, I, to I completely recognize the problems we're having with the culture of our military, how it's been used for political purposes, to advance a social agenda, woke ideology getting in. Day one as Commander-in-Chief, I rip all of that out and throw it in the trash, and we restore the military. No question. And then it also, just as somebody who's, who served in Iraq and, 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 and was with a lot of people that did multiple tours, uh, you know, I understand uh, you know, decisions that a Commander-in-Chief makes, the impact that it has on folks. And so you know, I would not make any decision very lightly. I am not going to put our troops in harm's way unless they have a clear mission and they have everything they need to achieve their mission. Um, and we should expect nothing less from any president. Putting them out there like Biden is to toil in Syria and just getting shot at and, and rockets at uh, by these Iranian groups. That is not the way you stand by our troops. 
to allow this nonsense that's going on. So when I'll be there, you know, we'll have a very strong policy. Uh, people are not going to want to mess with us. Uh, but if there ever needs to be a situation where our, where our troops need to be used, uh, we're going to go all in, we're going to win, and we're going to bring them home. That's what you got to do. So I look at some of the stuff. You know, these guys are, are, are great members of Congress. Uh, you know, we've got some good ones. We don't have enough of them on the Republican side, and certainly uh, not a lot on the other side of the aisle either. Uh, and, yes, electing better people will help, and we can do a lot as president, of course. But there's also, like, a longer-term issue here where the reason you get these bad outcomes out of Washington is because it's in, the incentives are to produce bad outcomes. You know, five of the eight wealthiest counties in our country are suburbs of Washington, D.C. How did that happen? Well, it happened because, you know, what they're doing is good for the people that are connected to the political class. Not so much good for the rest of us, but it is good for them. So those are the incentives. So I think we need to do things to change the incentives. That's why I'm a big believer in term limits for members of Congress. That's why I'm a big believer in a balanced budget requirement for the Constitution. That's why I'm a big believer in the line item veto for the president. You want to talk about fiscal responsibility. As governor, I get this. I get it. I get a budget. And I can veto out individual spending items. And I vetoed one year. I vetoed 3% of the entire budget. Uh, so you can do that. The president gets this massive bill. And it shouldn't be one massive bill, but, but it usually is. Gets a massive bill, and you either... Sign it and fund everything, or veto it and fund nothing. And so that's not a good recipe. And yet that's one of the reasons why your tax dollars get spent to do things like promote transgenderism in Bangladesh. Like, that shouldn't happen. And yet you see that. So how do you do it? Well, if the president had the ability to do that, you would be able to take out so much largesse and so much pork. Uh, it would be a huge, huge thing. So you got to work through the states to do that. We will do that. I'll lead the charge from the bully pulpit, and we're going to get some changes. The other thing that I've always thought was good, and I, I sponsored this back in the day, you know, I'd like to see a 28th Amendment to the Constitution that says very simply, Congress shall no, make no law respecting the citizens of the United States that does not also apply to members of Congress themselves. I mean, that would be a really good thing. So this is our time for choosing. Uh, my wife and I are, are they back there? Do they want to come out? Where are they at? Do they see if they want to come out? We got, the, we got anyone out here? So my wife and I, we've got a first grader, a kindergartner, uh, and a preschooler. There's our kindergartner. Okay. There's the missus. All right. Wave, buddy. You got ketchup. Oh, man. All right. He's not that happy because the Jaguars seem like they're getting their butt kicked right now. So he's a big football guy. So, so we, we, have, we have young kids. And so just as parents, we're very concerned about what kind of uh, America they're going to have five years from now, 10 years from now, but 25, 30 years from now. And so that's a big motivation uh, for us to run. But I'll tell you, I'm also motivated to run uh, because we owe a debt of gratitude to people in prior generations that have sacrificed so that we can be free. Uh, our founding fathers, when they went to create the Constitution in 1787, they came, they went to Philadelphia uh, with having studied the history of every republic and the history of mankind because they wanted to draw lessons from all of those experiences. And the one thing that they identified, the one common thread that all those republics had was this. Every single one of them had failed. And so they understood it fell to the United States of America to determine, can people really govern themselves? Can you have a society based on the idea that our rights come from God, not from government? That we live under a rule of law, not the rule of, not the rule of individual rulers? Or is mankind forever destined to live under various forms of despotism? And they fully expected that this country would decide that question once and for all. But they knew that what they did in Philadelphia and what they had done previously with the Declaration of Independence, that didn't ultimately answer that question. That just gave us a chance to answer the question. When Frank Benjamin Franklin walked out of the convention, he was asked, did you give us a republic or a monarchy? And his answer was, a republic if you can keep it. And it, Ronald Reagan pointed out, freedom's one generation away from extinction. It's not passed along in the bloodstream. They understood that every generation would have to step up and defend freedom when it was threatened. And I'm reminded of this 
uh, when I fly into Washington, D.C. When you go in to Reagan Airport, you sometimes take a route that takes the plane flush parallel to our National Mall. So if you look out the left side of the plane, you see beautiful panoramic view, Lincoln Memorial, the reflecting pool, uh, up the Washington Monument, other monuments, and then up perched on the hill, the beautiful U.S. Capitol building. You feel a sense of pride as an American because those are ideals and principles represented on those monuments uh, that have made this country great and unique. But after doing that a few times, I realized best monuments to our country and to freedom are not the left side of the plane on the National Mall. Because if you look out the other side of the plane, you look over the Potomac River, uh, you see a series of small, nondescript monuments orderly arranged over the rolling hills of a place called Arlington National Cemetery. And I believe that then, and I believe it now, you can have the best Declaration of Independence in the world. You can have the best Constitution in the world. These things do not run on autopilot. They require every generation of Americans to step up and defend freedom and sometimes put on a uniform, risk your life, and even give that last full measure of devotion for service to this country. Now, in this political season, we're not called upon to make sacrifices of that nature. Uh, but what we are called upon to do is to do justice to the sacrifices of people who are memorialized in places like Arlington National Cemetery. What we are called upon to do is to preserve what George Washington called the sacred fire of liberty. This was a fire that burned in Independence Hall in 1776 when 56 men pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to create a new nation conceived in liberty. It's a fire that burned at a cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, when our nation's first Republican president pledged this nation to a new birth of freedom. It's a fire that burned on the beaches of Normandy when a merry band of brothers stormed the shores, defeated Nazi Germany, and preserved liberty throughout the world. It's a fire that burned at the foot of the Berlin Wall in 1987 when a resolute Republican president stood in front of that wall and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, eventually seeing the dissolution of the Soviet Union. This is our responsibility, to carry this torch and to preserve this sacred fire of liberty. This is not a responsibility we should shy away from. This is a responsibility that we should welcome. Because if not now, when? And if not, us who? I'm asking for your support on January 15th in the Iowa caucus. Uh, I'll be somebody as a candidate that will get the job done electorally, just like we did in Florida, uh, and we'll win and win big. Uh, as a leader, uh, I'll always conduct myself in a way that you can be proud of. Uh, and as your president, uh, I don't care what they throw at me. I will get the job done, and I will not let you down. Thank you all. God bless you. Appreciate that. All right. Anybody have any questions?